Call of War World War II is a free online strategy game that gathers millions of players worldwide who fight up to 64 other players in real time, games that can take weeks to complete. The game features World War II historically accurate maps and units that allows you to create your own path and rewrite history. Call of War World War II is fully cross-platform. Your objective is to take over the world, define your own strategy, build powerful armies by combining dozens of different unit types and fight for world domination I've set up a special game of Call of War for the first viewers that click the link in the description. Go to the website or app, type my name in the search bar and enter the password Mark Felton. And Mark Felton Productions viewers are getting a special gift. Click on the link below to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. The offer is available for only 30 days. So click the link in the description, choose a country and fight your way to victory in epic real-time battles. Germany's surprise December 1944 Ardennes offensive could only have succeeded if certain conditions were met. Firstly, Hitler needed the element of surprise, and US intelligence largely ignored the build-up of German forces on the other side of the Belgian Ardennes. Secondly, the Germans needed bad weather to cloak the advancing columns from Allied air power, which had grown so strong that it had severely disrupted German efforts to counterattack in Normandy the previous summer. Launching the new Ardennes offensive in mid-December 1944 guaranteed fog and snow and low cloud over the region. And the third vital factor to ensure that the Germans would stand a fair chance of reaching their operational objectives at the Meuse River and the major Allied supply port at Antwerp was gaining control of the road system in the Ardennes. Once Volksgrenadier divisions had punched gaps into the thinly held US frontline positions running along the Belgian-German border, armoured exploitation forces would advance west at maximum speed, smashing aside remaining US resistance and seizing towns and villages until breaking out into better tank country beyond the Meuse to seize Antwerp, ruining Allied resupply efforts and dividing the US and British armies from each other, providing Hitler with a war-changing victory in the West. But the problem was the road system in the Ardennes. Some roads were metalled, but many were little more than farm tracks, and drenched with fog, rain and snow, they would disintegrate into muddy forest trails, hampering the Germans' ability to move armour and especially wheel transport forward quickly. Of vital importance for the plan were two major road centres, where roads heading west met and bifurcated, one in the north and one in the south of the operational zone. In the north was Saint-Vite, 11 miles behind the US lines, and in the south, Bastogne, or in the local dialect, Bastogne. One or both of these road centres had to be seized, otherwise it would fatally upset the Germans' advance, spending days transferring forces around these centres, enabling the Allies to launch a strong counterattack before the Germans could reach and cross the Meuse. Hitler had created, against usual doctrine, a two-pronged assault west. In the north was the 6th Panzer Army that would hammer west, while in the south was the 5th Panzer Army that would do the same via Bastogne, where seven major roads converged. In this manner, Hitler had two chances of reaching the Meuse, but dividing his forces did weaken the focal points of both attacks. The Germans were confident of success. Bastogne and the Ford positions in that sector were held by the badly depleted and exhausted US 28th Infantry Division that had been sent to the Ardennes to rest and refit after receiving a terrible mauling in the meat grinder battles in the Hürtgen Forest when the US tried to break into Germany in autumn and early winter 1944. The Germans planned to assault the Bastogne sector with three divisions. The 26th Volksgrenadier Division would smash through the U.S. outposts along the Ur River, with the 2nd Panzer Division exploiting Ford and the Panzer Lehr Division following behind. 
The assault commenced at 0530 hours on the 16th of December 1944, when a huge German artillery barrage struck US positions, smashing communications and causing great confusion. German engineers threw bridges across the Ur and Volksgrenadiers stormed the heights opposite, battling determined US resistance. Some penetrations were made, German armour following the infantry, and parts of the 28th Infantry Division became gradually isolated on the heights as German spearheads moved to capture towns and villages behind them. A particularly fierce battle developed at the Luxembourg town of Clairvaux, where cut-off U.S. troops mounted a strong last-stand action in Clairvaux Castle until battered into submission. See a link in the end screen to my video about this story. This and other pockets of U.S. resistance began to ruin the German timetable, enabling U.S. reinforcements to be pushed forward. The 28th Infantry Division had moved its headquarters from Wiltz in Luxembourg to Bastogne, Belgium, on the 19th of December. U.S. forces made a valiant stand at Wiltz, just 550 men, standing against a massive German force, but in the end they were all killed or captured. The 28th Division was virtually finished as an effective fighting force. But Bastogne had to be held, the US knowing full well its significance to the German plan. What remained of the 28th Division was hastily reinforced by Combat Command B of the US 10th Armoured Division, consisting of a tank and armoured infantry battalion, plus another tank and armoured infantry company, a tank destroyer company, and an armoured field artillery battalion, and three companies of support troops. It wouldn't be enough to deny the Germans Bastogne, so General Eisenhower ordered for two U.S. airborne divisions, the 82nd and 101st. The 101st arrived quickly after driving all night through the snow, and reached Bastogne in the early hours of the 19th of December. The 101st was under the temporary command of Brigadier General Anthony McAuliffe, and consisted of the 501st, 502nd and 506th Parachute Infantry Regiments and 327th Glider Infantry Regiment. The US paratroopers joined the forces already at Bastogne, occupying a series of villages all around the town and fighting many small battles as the Germans tried to get into the town. The 101st was used to block the 26th Volksgrenadier Division and Panzer Forces advancing on Bastogne. A small reserve of 40 tanks was created to be used as a fire brigade to support threatened sectors as required, but how long they could remain in action with dwindling fuel stocks was a concern. The defenders also had 36 155mm howitzers for fire support. Several batteries were from the 333rd Field Artillery Group, an African-American unit. But as Bastogne was now virtually surrounded, no normal ammunition resupply would be possible, again leading eventually to fire support coming to an end. The Germans were determined to capture Bastogne, as funneling tanks and men around the road centre on inferior tracks was so time-consuming that it was ruining their timetable. Outnumbering the Bastogne defenders by about five to one, the Germans were confident that the town could be seized and the siege ended quickly. By noon on the 21st of December 1944, the last roads out were captured and blocked by German forces. Without resupply, the US defence would quickly run out of ammunition, food, fuel and medical supplies, and simply collapse. The 2nd Panzer and Panzerlehr Divisions now moved on west, leaving the 26th Volksgrenadier Division to end the siege, supported by a single Panzer Regiment. The Germans now made a mistake. Instead of launching an all-out attack on the US perimeter and overwhelming the outnumbered Americans, they instead probed for weaknesses, allowing General McAuliffe to shift forces to resist each probe in turn. 
On the 22nd of December, the Germans sent a message to Mikhailov demanding he surrender his forces and threatening to level the place if he refused. Mikhailov's one-word reply, nuts, has gone down in military history both for its brevity and the translation difficulties it caused at German headquarters. The supply and medical situation, however, was becoming critical. No aerial resupply of Bastogne was possible between the 17th and the 22nd of December due to bad weather. However, on the 22nd, Pathfinder teams were dropped by parachute into the Bastogne perimeter to set up ground beacons for aerial resupply from England. On the 23rd of December, the aerial resupply began, with 21 C-47s flying over Bastogne, coming under heavy German anti-aircraft fire. One American aircraft was shot down, but the remaining 20 dropped their supplies accurately. Later in the same day, a second resupply mission was made by 44 C-47s. Only 28 reached the drop zone due to German flak, many being shot down or damaged. The biggest effort came later on the 23rd, when 264 C-47s attempted to reach Bastogne. 253 made it and dropped 334 tons of ammunition, rations and medical supplies, enough to keep the 101st Airborne going for only one day. On Christmas Eve, another big effort was made. Between 10.25 and 10.41, 157 C-47s flew over Bastogne, but again many aircraft were damaged by ground fire. On Christmas Day, no aerial resupply sorties could be made as the weather had closed in again. The day before, on Christmas Eve, the 26th Volksgrenadier Division had received some more reinforcements, a Panzergrenadier Regiment, and to help soften up Bastogne, the Luftwaffe had bombed the town, causing much damage and many casualties. On Christmas Day, the Germans launched a series of attacks on the west side of Bastogne, another mistake. One probe of 18 tanks with Panzergrenadiers aboard got through the US perimeter and made it to the 327th Glider Infantry's 1st Battalion command post at Emreul before being smashed. With tank destroyer support, the German columns were smashed by parachute infantry and US armor. The 26th of December would witness a series of daring American attempts to resupply Bastogne. Although the weather was still poor, 260 C-47s eventually managed to make resupply runs over Bastogne in five waves, one aircraft being shot down and 26 badly damaged. One of the primary problems facing the besieged Americans in Bastogne was a chronic shortage of both medical supplies and, very importantly, medically trained personnel. The wounded and sick continued to grow at the temporary hospital in the town. The town of Etain, behind the main U.S. lines, 13 doctors, medics and female nurses had volunteered to be taken to Bastogne. The question was how to get them there. No vehicles could get through the German positions surrounding Bastogne, and none of the medical personnel were trained parachutists, and there wasn't time to train them. As C-47s had nowhere to land inside the town's perimeter, the only possible way in was by military glider. The medical personnel were collected on the 26th of December in the morning from the 12th Evacuation Hospital by personnel of the 96th Squadron 444th Troop Carrier Group, based at Orleans. The first glider operation involved a single C-47 towing one WACO glider in a very risky operation. Escorted by four P-47 Thunderbolts, the C-47 cast the glider loose near Bastogne, and it glided down to make a safe landing in a snowy field northwest of the town. There was no ground fire, the Germans preferring not to reveal their positions for the sake of one puny glider. The doctors and medical staff and the supplies were immediately driven by jeeps to the battered hospital in town. 
but a much bigger operation was planned for the afternoon of the 26th. Ten more WACO gliders would bring in 16 tons of fuel and other supplies, under the code name Operation Repulse. This time the Germans would not remain silent, and the 20 glider pilots, two to a machine, were seriously worried that the loads that they were carrying might erupt into flames if the Germans used tracer rounds. As the ten gliders approached Bastogne, the Germans duly let rip with flak cannons, intense tracer zipping past their wings, but in the failing light all ten gliders, many of them damaged, managed to land safely, precious cargoes intact. The next day, 27th of December, the mission was repeated, though this time each glider had only one pilot. Many carried artillery ammunition, as the guns at Bastogne were down to around 20 rounds per barrel. 52 gliders took part in this new mission. The flak density was astounding, and from Seabray all the way into the landing zone, the planes and gliders were under heavy fire. Nearly all of the C-47s were hit, with bullet and cannon shell damage to their wings, stabilizers, fuel tanks, tires, radios shot out, engines gone, and fuselages peppered. Fifteen gliders were shot down, and seventeen C-47 tow planes were also lost but 53 precious tons of supplies reached Bastogne. Fortunately for all concerned, further glider missions were scrapped as General Patton's relief force approached Bastogne on the 27th of December. Patton's spearhead had actually managed to contact the 326th engineers on the 26th of December, but on the 27th the corridor was widened enough and the 101st Airborne now had access to US supply dumps outside the perimeter and all the wounded were evacuated to the rear. The 101st went over to the offensive, capturing a series of villages north of Bastogne, including Foy, and to the northeast towards Boursy, into January 1945 against stubborn German resistance. Bastogne was one of the most famous battles of World War II, but American resistance would have folded if not for the bravery of C-47 and glider pilots who kept the 101st and its other units resupplied. The aircraft and gliders received terrible punishment from German flak and ground fire, but kept returning, delivering just enough supplies to enable the US defenders to keep on fighting for another day until finally relieved by Patton's Third Army. A very Merry Christmas to all of my subscribers and viewers. Please do visit my other YouTube channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.